Welcome to this uh, press conference. Um, the theme of uh, this press conference is called Arctic Sea Ice is in Terminal Retreat. And the speaker is um, Peter Wadhams, and he's from the University of Cambridge. So, good luck. Thank you. Um, what I want to cover um, and talk about is uh, really a, a mixture of, of papers that are going to be given tomorrow at morning at the Climate of the Polar Region session. Uh, so I'm, I'm the chairman of that session, yeah. but uh, uh, I'm sort of representing several speakers in my what I'm going to say here. And uh, also, as you see from the, the bottom of the title here, this, this was also presented last week at the Arctic Shipping Summit in Helsinki, which is a, an, another forum where everybody's very concerned about what's going to be happening to the Arctic from the point of view of navigation. Um, so the, the, uh, the climate sessions are, are chiefly concerned about what are the implications for global climate of the, the disappearance of Arctic sea ice and also is it actually going to disappear? Is the, the retreat that we've seen in the last three years uh, simply a, a, a part of a cycle or is it really the start of a trend which is going to lead towards the, the rapid, complete disappearance of Arctic sea ice in summer? And uh, my own view, and I think the view of, of the, the speakers, the other speakers at this session, is that it's part of a trend which is going to lead to the, certainly the, the disappearance of the summer sea ice but uh, that may take 20 to 40 years to, to happen, but it will happen. So I'll, I'll show some evidence, some of the evidence of why we think that's going to be the case. And uh, of course, it doesn't mean that the Arctic sea ice will disappear in the sum in the winter. It's still going to be there in the winter, but it will be thinner, and it'll be largely uh, what's called first-year ice, which are, which is ice that that forms it during the winter and completely disappears in the summer. Uh, Antarctic ice is, is first year ice and that kind of ice is thin and it's easy to sail through in an icebreaker. What we've had in the Arctic up to now has been a lot of multi-year ice, that's ice that's several years old, that's very thick and very rugged and difficult to, to get through with, with, a, with an icebreaker. So that ice is disappearing from the Arctic and is being replaced with this thin ice which is what we'll end up having in the winter and we'll end up having no ice at all in the summer. Um, earlier, uh, last, last year, there was a, an effort by a, a bunch of explorers uh, to, to, to walk around in, in a part of the Arctic that uh, these are typical British explorers, that is, they use the most primitive methods, uh, that walk around in a part of the Arctic where uh, people normally don't go, that's near the North Pole. And they found that uh, using these rather primitive methods, that they were that the entire part of their transect across the Arctic was in first-year ice. And this was all in a part of the Arctic which normally we think of as a multi-year ice region. So that's just, it, it, it doesn't give us a lot of new data, it's, but it does illuminate what's, what's going on, uh, which is that the, 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 what we're seeing in the summer now is, is the culmination of, of a process that's been going on for a long time since we've actually been able to to measure uh, the the ice extent, we've it has been decreasing. We've been able to measure the extent for about 30 years from satellites, and we found that it's been going down. But it was going down fairly gently, about three to four percent per decade. That was a gentle decrease. But in the last few years, it's risen to about 10 percent per decade, a much more rapid decrease. And the other extraordinary thing has been the thinning of the ice cover. And this has been possible to measure only since we started to go to the Arctic in submarines, because you can't measure the thickness of the ice from satellites, not, not properly. Um, you, you have to go underneath and measure the thickness with echo sounders looking upwards. And the first Arctic submarines were in the late 1950s, 1958. So we've got about 40 to 50 years of data on thickness. 
and that's shown an incredible reduction of about over 40 percent in average ice thickness in the last 25 years so if you think of the arctic ice cover as kind of like an egg shell, like part of an egg shell the bit you you cut off when you when you open your boiled egg it's that that egg shell has shrunk has got a little bit smaller but it's got very much thinner and that means it's become much more fragile much more easy to break up in summer so part of the reason and i think most of the reason for this very recent summer disappearance has been that the ice has been subjected to over 30 years of thinning from a gradually warming atmosphere warming ocean and that thinning has left it in in a vulnerable state such that it's, it's so thin in summer that it breaks up and melts away completely so the evidence for that uh, comes from satellite first of all from satellites that's the evidence of retreat comes from satellites but the evidence for thinning is coming from submarines so this is the retreat evidence is the top one shows the the annual cycle of ice area in the arctic if you take away that average it, it looks like it's going through the same cycle each year but you take away that cycle you're left with a, a steady decrease and the anomaly and that decrease the climatic models that used to exist this is a model that's a few years old and is now generally uh, shown to be wrong uh, is that the that what we have now which is the red limits by the end of the century will shrink to the white limits so that there'll be almost as much ice as there is now in winter and in summer there'll be a lot less but there'll still be some ice and this and this prediction was was what climate models um, run by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change were, were coming up with as recently as 10 years ago that there would still be plenty of ice around by the end of the century and uh, the recent developments have gone w right, right outside those models uh, so we can see for instance the August ice extent steadily decreasing but then in 2007 which was the record year decreasing a, a lot more and of course this is a famous map that everybody shows the, the left hand side the pink outline is the the average over the last 30 years for what happens in summer and the white is what actually happened in 2007 which was a huge chunk taken out of the the uh, central arctic ice over on the Beaufort Sea side that's the the US Canadian Russian side of the arctic and uh, quite a lot of ice still in the Greenland Sea on, on the European side of the Arctic but an area of at least a million square kilometers disappeared relative to any previous year the previous record year is the little inset and it's it's way back from there um, after 2007 there's been an, actually a slight recovery this the, the 2007 wasn't the start of rapid disappearance it paused in the last couple of years which is what's led some people to think maybe it's actually not it's going to come back but um, I think the evidence is that it's only a pause um, the first thing is that the if we look at the motion of the ice um, with we've had boys out on the ice uh, continuously and the, the tracks of these boys during the summer of 2007 shows all the ice being moved by the wind across the arctic and being pushed out through fram strait that's between greenland and spitsbergen so the wind field in the arctic has been helping to push the ice out and um the there was a the drop in area has been something that's happened in the winter as well as in the summer so all the colored lines here show the annual cycle of area in the arctic um the extent at the top that's the that's the um, the area inside the ice edge and the area is is the area occupied by ice so each of the years in the past were quite similar to previous years so all the different colors are our succession of years but then 2005 onwards it dropped to a whole new kind of cycle it's, it's much lower than before in the summer but it's also lower than before in the winter so the uh, the ice cover has jumped or jumped downwards to a new uh, a new kind of cycle which is which is much less ice uh, in all seasons of the year uh, not just in the summer and this again is the other famous picture which shows the red uh, 
curve being the actual measured area of ice, which has been dropping since 1960, and in the last, in the 2007, dropped right down to a very low value. But the, all the other curves uh, are the predictions of IPCC models, and the, the, the black, the very black wiggly line is the prediction of the average of all the IPCC models. And you can see the model predictions say that ice will still be around in the summer right to the end of the century. But the reality has been that the ice area has been dropping below those predictions for, for some years now. In fact, since about 1970, it's been dropping below the averages predictions. And now it's dropped below all the extreme values of the predictions. It's right down below um, any of the models. So the models have got something wrong with them. They, there's something, the various things that people have thought about that are missing from the models. And one of the main ones, I think, is that the, the models don't show the way in which the ice breaks up in summer. It breaks up by developing pools of meltwater on the surface, which are dark. They absorb a lot more solar radiation. That warms the water up in the melt pools. They melt their way through the ice and then bring that warm water to the bottom of the ice where it can melt the ice from the bottom and the ice then breaks up and then the water absorbs even more radiation. So it's a cooperative breakup caused by the ice being too thin to start with at the beginning of summer, breaking up and melting and then that means that the warming, the water that, that's exposed in that way is warmed up and that melts the ice even faster. So it's a kind of a feedback mechanism by which the breakup of the ice is accelerated by the processes that are going on as the, the weakened ice encounters summer conditions. And that isn't uh, used in these IPCC models, which are very crude in, in their treatment of sea ice. They're, they're good in their treatment of overall climate. Um, so I'll, I'll just flip through these because I don't want to spend too long because I'd rather you ask some questions. Uh, so, but I'll just go on to say, well, the measurements of all this have been done. Of the, the this was the the retreat, but the thinning, which is the the thing that has is is allowing this retreat to happen, has been measured by over the years now by U.S. and British submarines, and I, I've been doing the British submarines since 1970s. Uh, where you measure the thickness of the ice with an upward-looking echo sound, and this gives you this kind of profile, shows you the, all the rough bits, the pressure ridges, and the smooth bits, and you get a distribution of thickness that way, plus an average. And this shows, for instance, for part of the Arctic, what the average values are, and the bottom left is 1976, and you can see there's a lot of heavy ice against the coast of Greenland, seven meters on average thickness. In 1987, with another submarine, we get, we're only getting four to five meters over there. And then in, nine, in 2004, with our last but one submarine, we were only getting three meters. So there's been this huge fall off of average thickness all over the Arctic Ocean. There's been a huge loss of pressure ridges that the bottom left shows uh, how many ridges there are now, about one per kilometer, and there used to be about three per kilometer. Um, the overall models now are showing an average loss in the center of the Arctic of about 0.16 of a meter per year. And the average is, is, is already about three meters to start with, so that's really saying that within 20 years the ice will be gone. Our most recent voyages were from uh, a submarine in 2007. And one of the papers tomorrow will be showing some results from this 2007 voyage. Uh, and this shows that uh, we were crossing the entire Arctic, but mainly we were coming to a part of the Arctic uh, where on the left-hand side of the red line near Prudhoe Bay, which was where uh, the ice completely disappeared from this region in, in the summer of 2007. We were there in the winter just before that and were, ab were able to measure the thickness and we found, and I'll move quickly on to what we found, um, this, this right-hand curve uh, sh shows that an average thickness in that area of less than 
two meters or the 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 peak of the distribution showed a thickness of 1.85 meters now um, people who had drifting buoys out uh, on the thicker ice found that two meters were melting during the summer there was such a lot of warm water in the arctic that it was losing two meters off the bottom uh, in the summer while the we were finding that the average in the winter was only 1.85 meters so it's not surprising that ice disappeared because its average thickness was less than the amount of bottom melt that was happening so that that's i think what what the evidence was and i'll just end up with these some pretty pictures these these were using an unmanned vehicle which is how we now now that submarines are hard to come by um increasingly people are working from unmanned un autonomous underwater vehicles auvs and we get some very nice pictures of the bottom of the ice from those. This was the last submarine voyage we had, where unfortunately we had a, an explosion on board, so it was not a very pleasant voyage. Um, but this is the sort of data we now get from submarines and from AUVs, shows the whole structure of the bottom of the ice. It shows the uh, 3D picture, whereas before we were just getting a profile. So we can see the shapes of ridges, we can see we can see everything that's going on and especially we can see how the ice is melting so that's giving us a lot of information that we need to be able to understand this process better and we, we now are using these small vehicles uh, which are just small enough that we just cut a hole in the ice and deploy them by hand and they come back to us at the end of the voyage and give us the data on ice thickness so we can deploy those uh, just from a plane and uh, set up a little camp and that the whole of that vehicle is contained in the boxes that are on the left hand side of the picture so um, here's some data from these AUVs and the the structure of these ridges um, is what uh, enables us to, to sort of see in what way they are melting away quickly because of this changed structure of the Arctic ice and um, we're certainly seeing, for instance, on the left-hand side of this picture, that's a multi-year ridge, which used to be thought of as a very formidable obstacle, is now being eroded away such that there's, there's these melt channels going right through it. So um, I'll, I'll sort of end there with my presentation. I, I've got too many slides. <laughs> but um, I'll really pass it over for questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Peter. Jonathan Amos, good to see you. Oh, hi. Um, mm. uh, I mean, as, as you know, um, the uh, sceptic community has, has grabbed hold of, of the past few months to, to show that uh, the Arctic is uh, returning to, uh, what is it, normal levels of, of ice cover. Why is that not a correct description of what is going on uh, in the Arctic currently? Um, well, it's... Uh, it, it's incorrect because although the the area has gone partially back, uh, or rather, it's it stayed close to its 2007 minimum. It hasn't gone back to the previous averages, but the volume has continued to go down. So, in fact, the National Snow and Ice Data Centre in Boulder has just come out with a a volume analysis. Uh, they've got a which is you know, multiplying the the area by the the average thickness that's kept on going down because the amount of multi-year ice in the arctic has kept diminishing and the the um the volume anomaly has has actually accelerated in its in its decline so if you look at the ice volume in the arctic that's kept on decreasing even though the area has has, has gone back a little way so there's there isn't any any let up in in the disappearance of the ice if you consider the volume which is the important thing and then a, 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 an add to that is what what difference will cryosat make to the work that people like you do um well the the gain i guess is that uh it gives data through continuously so you don't have to rely on uh episodic exercise it's where you have a submarine or can go out with a vehicle uh, that's so that's a big gain um, the problems with it are that it, it still hasn't been properly validated so that it's measuring uh, freeboard that's the the amount of ice above the surface and 
to get from freeboard to thickness, you have to multiply by a big number because most of the ice is submerged. So you're multiplying by 7 or somewhere between 7 and 10, whereas to go from draft, which you measure from a submarine, uh, to thickness, you only add about 10%. Uh, so there's problems with that big factor of multiplication, which changes with time of year because it's responsive to how much snow there is on the ice. So it, it's giving its drawbacks. Are I think that that multiplying factor is not really certain, and it could be introducing some rather large errors. And also, it's giving you area average values, which disguise these problems with different types of different types of ice. Uh, for instance, something I didn't show here, but well, it, it's here, but I passed it over, was that we 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 ran over again in 2007 an area that we'd gone over in the submarine in 2004, uh, north of Greenland, and we found that the thicknesses were exactly the same on average, uh, completely the same distribution of thicknesses across the north of Greenland, and yet the composition of the ice was completely different. Um, in 2007, it was mainly this first-year ice, which is, is much thinner. So what was happening was that it was thinner, younger ice that had formed more pressure ridges, and that brought the average up to the same value as the previous uh, three years earlier, which was thi thicker, older ice, but it didn't have so many ridges in it. So if you're only measuring averages, you wouldn't see that process at, at all. You, you have to measure the whole thickness distribution. So uh, you, you've got these caveats which you have to be aware of, but maybe the uh, cryosat enthusiasts don't tend to stress those. But, but it does have big advantages as well in that you are getting continuous data so you can see how, it's, how, how trends are going. Any more questions? Uh, Randy Shostak, reporter with EOS, the newspaper of the American Geophysical Union. Um, can you explain uh, why are submarines harder to come by now, and are the ATVs providing as good information? And also, um, is the U.S. and other countries uh, uh, sharing any information from their military subs, and would that information be helpful? Um, well, they're harder to come by in Britain because we haven't got so many. Um, we used to be able to get data about every other year, sometimes every year, from, from a UK submarine and uh, often going out in it ourselves. But the last one was 2007 and the won't, next one won't be for a, another three years. So there's, there's a, a big decrease in availability of UK submarines just because of reduced numbers. US submarines, there was uh, there's still availability but the, the program has changed. There was a program called SizeX, which ran for 10 years and, and had uh, voyages that were specific for science, and, and they were entirely scientific voyages. And then that changed to a system rather like the British system, which were that the voyages were operational, but they would do scientific work whilst, whilst doing them. Uh, and in the uh, collecting data or, or in the case of UK submarines taking scientists on board. So the U US program has continued at a lower level because of this change to away from SizeX to what's called ac accommodation cruises where the you, you do scientific work but not prim as a primary need. Um, the UK eff effort, I mean, UK is, is really very committed uh, to collecting scientific data from submarines, so that the, the, the spirit is very willing, but the, the flesh is, is weak because they don't have many <laughs> submarines. Um, and but there is a, a joint. There's now a, a, an agreement. In fact, there was a meeting last week in in Scotland uh, between the the UK and the US submarine people. This was a meeting sponsored by ONR uh, and and the UK NERC, in which. Um, the new phase of SizeX, called SizeX 2010, which is going to be what will be done in science from US submarines, is, is being uh, merged or, or blended with what the UK wants to do 
with in future submarines and so it's hoped that the two countries will just really work together to get maximum scientific benefit from submarines in the future so that that's something coming out and in fact uh the proceedings of that meeting we, we were going to write it up as an article for eos <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. In, in real terms, what has been the, uh, the, the drop-off in data that's happened perhaps because of this uh, different operation with SISEX, and will SISEX, the new one, uh, make much of a difference? Um, well, I think the, the drop-off in data um, is when sort of real, I suppose, big SISEX ended, was largely a drop-off in oceanographic data because of the the way when the scientists were manning the submarine, they could surface and do CTDs. They could do a lot of oceanographic work. But um, what's continuing and hasn't dropped off is really the collection of ice thickness data because they'll still run their sonars, we'll still run ours, and in fact we'll be putting these multi-beam sonars on every time. So that really will continue at the same level. And then AUVs, which you mentioned, um, at the moment, it's been experimental, and a lot of it has been specific process studies where you go out to an ice camp with a small AUV, you put it in to look at particular ridges and look at processes going on to try and understand the physics. But you could use long-range AUVs as a survey, an Arctic-wide survey tool, and to replace submarines. And there's both the US and, and the UK are developing... Uh, basin-wide uh, AUVs with basin-wide capability. Uh, in fact, the, U the US has had one in development for a long time, but it, it, I think it has a, it's had a lot of teething troubles. It was developed at Monterey Bay Institute and hasn't yet crossed the Arctic, but it's designed to do that. And so when, that, when those sort of vehicles are operational, you, you won't need, for, for, for ice thickness mapping, you won't need submarines anymore. Um, but at the moment, you do need them, and uh, but they're and they're still generating the thickness data. Thanks. Just a question to to the differences between one year and multi year ice, uh, apart from mm -hmm. the age, of course. Do they look different? Is it possible to see that from space or from from below? Do they have um, a different color or whatever? Oh yes. Well, um, the uh, they. First of all, they, they feel different. Um, the undeformed part is, is about three meters thick instead of one and a half. So it's really rugged ice. It's gone through several cycles of melting and refreezing. I'm just trying to show you. Well, this is a side scan sonar picture of multi year ice from underneath. And the shadow parts show ridges. And the, there's two big undeformed f ice flows, but they're not. They're not smooth on the bottom like first year ice. Is it looks at, they look a bit like uh, the surface of the moon, and if you're walking over the top of those, you get the similar sensation. They're very rugged, um, and the ice is not only does it look different and feel different, but it is different because it's lost all of its salt, so it's very strong. Uh, so if you hit that with an icebreaker, you generally damage the icebreaker. Whereas first year ice you can easily break it's it's still quite weak and but there's less and less of this multi year ice and you can you can detect it on satellites both uh, mic passive microwave and a scatterometer is the, the instrument of choice now uh, that actually detects its its roughness so what we now see is that uh, in fact i've got a well there'll be a <laughs> There'll be a, a slide tomorrow. It's not on this set, but it's on a set that somebody's showing tomorrow uh, of satellite data showing the decline of multi-year ice over the last few years. And it shrunk back from occupying maybe two-thirds of the Arctic, and it shrunk back until it's just a little band now north of Greenland and Ellesmere Island, just around the, the, the fringe of the Arctic Ocean. And that's I suppose what I would call the Alamo, it's, it's, it's the last holdout the, of the ice because the multi-year ice will last longer than, than first-year ice. So what we'll end up with is that fringe will survive in the summer and all the rest will go. So that will be the last ice to completely disappear. But there's, there is less of it than there was.
Uh, yes, I have a question uh, regarding uh, the models of Arctic sea ice. Uh, uh, what is the, the current, uh, uh, I don't know, consensus or uh, a general idea of what uh, Arctic sea ice extent uh, will be? Uh, will, will it uh, eventually reach a, uh, a new equilibrium or will it just continue to decline? Or um, well, well, all the, the models now um, point to a continued decline. Um, when when this really big drop occurred in in 2007 uh, there were some fairly wild ecos analyses that thought it might go it might go in about 5 years but that was extrapolating linearly which is which dangerous things to um but what what happened when more cautious people went back and looked at these this these 12 ipcc models that that all combined in in in, in not predicting the decline and looked at which were the worst and which were the best or the least bad. And um, this was um, Jim Overland and, and Wang from uh, Seattle. They looked at the, the least bad of the IPCC models and tweaked them uh, to match the data and then ran them forward. And they, they ended up giving about another 20 to 30 years uh, for for the survival of the summer sea ice and then it will it will, will all be gone um so that you'd probably that that implies uh, a significant retreat over the next 10 to 15 years to to this alamo re region and then a slower retreat of that last that last ice but but it it still points to a a conti this is a paper by wang and overland that just came out last year and uh it points to, a, and, and there'll be some more things reported tomorrow morning, um, but it, it points to a continued retreat uh, at all seasons, but the summer ice disappearing in 20 to 30 years, the winter ice um, just shrinking back somewhat. Um, there isn't, there isn't any, any models I know of that, that uh, predict uh, any kind of cycle. I mean, models that that really invoke a lot of cyclic behavior like um, the uh, solar, solar activity and so on, they, they still can't come up with a, a return to previous conditions. That, that, that seems to be just outside the, the limits of, of model predictability. Uh, perhaps Peter, you could just. I, I haven't spoken to Vislav Maslowski recently. Is has his model uh, drifted out a, a bit now in terms of when he is forecasting mm. um, ice-free conditions in summer? Because uh, he had the most, yes. how should we say, aggressive model. Yes, he? it was. Yes, he, he's he's now uh, more in line with the, the Wang and Overland. In fact, he's at the conference, and uh, so he, he was <laughs> he was at the session I've just come out of. <laughs> so he, he'll probably be at the session tomorrow morning so if you can get up at 8 30 there's, <laughs> there's <laughs> the uh, the ci session is uh, is is 8 30 in the morning in room 18. <laughs> you showed so you, you talked about the wind field that is sort of pushing the all the ice towards mm. uh, the strait between iceland and spitsbergen is, is that sort of funnel effect, and would the ice compact there and maybe hold out, or something like that? Uh, yes, that that's what um, that was what what seemed to be happening in this. The fact that when we when we went to this region north of Greenland in two thousand four uh, and crossed it quite close to the Greenland coast, and then went back in two thousand seven, we found the ice was just as thick in two thousand seven, but its its composition was different in that there was it was thinner first year ice that's thinner undeformed when undeformed but it was more heavily ridged so the ridging made up for the initial thinness and gave you the same overall average thickness but that was because it was more heavily ridged and that was being because it was being sort of pushed the wind was pushing the whole ice cover down into fram strait and it's it's narrowing it's like when you have uh, a motorway where you have lane closures everything jams up and slows down until you get into the you get into the the one lane that's open and then it sh everything rushes through so the ice is is jamming against the entrance to fram strait a lot of pressure ridges are building up and then it goes through fram strait uh, but 
we found in, in 2007 summer that, that there was more ice in Fram Strait than in a normal year, and that's because of the, this, this flow of ice across from the, other, from the rest of the Arctic Ocean. So, so yes, there was, more, there was more ridge building going on in the area just upstream of Fram Strait, but it was building up ridges in ice that was initially thinner. Stefan Tanzani from Nature Publishing Group. Um, uh, you mentioned that some, um, a lot of the failure of the climate models to predict the extent of um, Arctic sea ice retreat um, is due to the fact that they don't capture some of the mechanisms of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the retreat, basically the pooling, like you said. Um, presumably, this points to some failure uh, in the spatial resolution yes. clearly of the models. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much would you need to improve the spatial resolution in order of magnitude with respect to what you um, already have, two orders of magnitude? Yes, uh, there's, well, there's quite a lot of work going on. I'll just show you some of the, um, <coughs> the, uh, the melt pool problem. Um, that um, yeah, we have some melt pools <laughs> and a polar bear. Um, that in, in the summer, this... Uh, you always do get these surface melt pools developing as the snow and ice uh, melt and then then they absorb solar radiation very rapidly because they're dark and they can melt right through and form thaw holes this doesn't didn't used to happen but what's happening now is because the ice is thinner to start with as it approaches the summer these melt pools just completely break the ice up they melt right through the ice has no strength it all breaks up and you're creating First of all, you're, you're p releasing this warmed water into the, into the ocean, and that's increasing the temperature of the surface water, which moves under the rest of the ice and melts it from below. But also, because the ice is now breaking up under the impact of these melt pools, um, it's breaking up into, into a bunch of small flows. Uh, again, that creates a lot of open water in between the flows, and that absorbs more radiation. So to... To model that process, you have to do change thermodynamics for the the uh, the incoming radiation, the, the initial state of the ice, which is thinner, and also now because there's so much open water, you're getting the the ocean waves in the are having an impact. That so wave the waves passing through the ice are also breaking it up. So you have your model has to include all these mesoscale processes, and the climate change or the climate models that the reason the IPCC climate models were w didn't really respond was they they didn't consider these smaller scale processes they they because they they're really set up to deal with large scale interactions so there's there's quite a lot of people who are, are doing specifically these small scale models trying to understand processes that that on a scale you can get at like this sort of thing and then embed them into the larger scale models. And um, Morales Makeda from Liverpool is, is one of those, and he's giving a paper tomorrow. Um, maybe a more, one, one, one more question? No? Let's see on the internet. No. All right. I would like to thank you very much, and good luck with the presentation tomorrow. Oh, I'll say at what time? It's, again? it's, it's room 18 and it's uh, CL. Ah, perfect. <laughs> and it starts at 8.30 <laughs> if, you yeah. if you're really keen. But, uh, <laughs> okay. but yeah. Good luck with the research. <laughs>